Okay, so let's get started. Uh, yeah, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to give this talk today. And yeah, thank you for the invite. Um, so today I'll talk about DeepCap, Monocular Human Performance Capture using VIG Supervision. Uh, one second. Yeah, but uh, yeah, before we go in, we dive into the topic itself, let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, so I'm Mark Habermann, a, third, a fourth year PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics. Um, and I work in the graphics, vision and video group headed by Professor Dr. Christian Theobald. And my main research interests are actually human performance capture, surface tracking and neural rendering. So on a, yeah, in a broader view, it's computer vision and graphics. Um, yeah, if you want to have also check out my other projects I did in the past, you can have a look at my personal webpage um, where they are all listed. Okay, so without further delay, let's get into the topic. And I would like to start this with a very fundamental question, which is uh, why human performance capture is actually important. And as you can imagine, there is a wide field of applications where it could be used. Uh, one could be a virtual reality where you can insert your 3D character that we track into a 3D world, like a virtual one, and you can drive it with your motions. Um, another application could be an augmented reality scenario, as you can see it here, um, where you film the person and you can augment reality in some way. So in this case, they were putting a small version of the guy who was filmed on the table. And another thing could be a virtual try-on, where you stand in front of a virtual screen and uh, you see your virtual double in the mirror, so to say, and you can change apparel, you can change pose, and you can also change the appearance of the apparel. Um, and yet another application could be a gaming scenario where you can film yourself and by filming yourself, you can directly drive your CG character. So not by controlling it via a mouse pad or something else, but you can just directly move and the character is moving according to your motion. So um, what all of these applications have in common is that you need a real-time capable capturing method, right? Um, and since people want to use these applications ultimately, ultimately at home in their daily life, um, it's also important to have a very easy capture setup. And ideally, this should be just a single color camera because, yeah, I mean, everyone has a smartphone and then you could just film yourself. Um, right, so that's why we propose DeepCap, which is a human performance capture approach that lets you control your virtual character with a single RGB camera, as you can see here in the video, and it's usable in a daily life scenario. So as you can see, this sequence, for example, was filmed with a handheld camera. Um, and but not only the poses tracked, as you can see here, but we also track the non-rigid surface deformation, which can account for clothing deformations, for example, the swinging of the dress here. And um, last, uh, I think it's also a very important point, is that um, our method can be trained in a weekly supervised way. So we do not need uh, expensive ground truth uh, 3D supervision. OK, so in general, so what are the challenges in this domain? Uh, in general, reconstructing the entire 3D pose, as well as the surface, just from a single video is very challenging for a lot of reasons, actually. So I think the most important one is actually that the monocular setting is inherently ambiguous, uh, for example, due to depth ambiguity, as it is, which is also visualized here in this uh, image. So you cannot really say what the depth is actually in the image without having any more priors on it. Um, and second, bodies are highly articulated, which makes them very challenging to track. And this can also cause a lot of self occlusions. For example, the arm is occluded by the body, um, where you have to find where you have to find solutions for it, right? And uh, the last problem I would say or challenge in this domain is um, that the problem itself is very high dimensional. So if you only look at the pose by itself in terms of joint angles, we have a lot of joints and also a lot of angles on our skeleton. So you have a high, very high dimensional space you are you want to get the solution out of. And adding on top the surface deformation makes this even more hand dimensional. So if you look at related work in this direction, there's a lot of previous and exciting work. And they tackle these challenges in different ways. Um, so some of them, for example, use depth sensors. Um, and these approaches can deal with topological changes um, 
So for example, if the, if the surface is, if you put out, uh, if you put off the jacket or something like this, uh, by um, using a fusion-based technique. Um, but on the other hand, um, the step sensors have a very high power consumption and they also do not work under all lighting conditions, as well as that the subject has to be uh, very close to the sensor. Um, on the other hand, there's uh, multi-view methods, um, which can capture the surface detail very well, as you can see here in these results. Uh, nonetheless, this setup is very expensive and hard to set up because you have to mount the cameras, you have to calibrate them, and you have to have multiple ones, um, which prevents them from being used apart from industry and research. So that's why a different line of work actually tried to simplify the, set, the capture setup in the sense that they only focus on a single RGB image. And there are different categories um, of related work um, depending on what kind of representation they are using. So one of them is uh, monocular template free captures and they show very nice generalization across clothing categories as you can see here. Um, what remains challenging for some of them is the generalization to very articulated poses and on the other hand, also having a temporally consistent geometry. And then there is yet another line of work that uses parametric body models, for example, the quite known uh, simple model. Um, and while pose and the shape of the naked human body can be recovered from a single image, it can still not represent the clothing. So you don't get uh, any clothing details in these models. And I think most, re most closely related to our approach are template-based methods that can account for clothing deformations. Um, nevertheless, the surface deformations that can be tracked are mostly the, the ones that is visible to the, to the camera. So for example, my previous work, we were not able to deform the back of the person if it was not captured by the camera, or it was only deformed by spatial priors, basically. And to address this, uh, we present deep cap. Um, but before we dive into the topic, let me show you some assumptions that we make before we actually, before I actually explain the algorithm. Um, so what we assume is that we have a personalized 3D template mesh of the subject to be tracked, uh, which you can see here on the left. And then in a fully automatic way, we get the embedded graph, which is nothing else than a low resolution, low res version of the original template mesh. And we also get a rigged skeleton that is attached to the template mesh. Okay, so and then at inference time, uh, our method takes a single segmented RGB image, which you can see on the left. And then our PostNet regresses the pose of the skeleton and our second module DefNet is regressing the surface deformations. But as you can see, it's regressed in a canonical pose. Um, and then once you have both of them, you can combine it and you get the post and deformed character. So the obvious question is, uh, how do we train it? Um, so as I already mentioned in the beginning, uh, directly supervising these both networks is very difficult because you would have to capture ground roof pose, which, you, which is maybe possible with markerless multi-view capture methods. But on the other hand, you also have to get ground roof registered uh, 3D geometry. And this is rather hard to obtain because you have to fit a template to either multi-view images like RGB images or some depth maps uh, that you can obtain from them. And this is a non-trivial process. So uh, that's Mark, why we... Sorry. Mark, yes. can, I, can I ask a question on previous sure. slide? Yes. Uh, 11, sorry. Oh, 11, yes. Uh, maybe 10. <laughs> it was about the, the assumption. Yes. Ah, this so is I, yeah. Uh, uh, so I missed that part. You're uh, supposing that you have a, a template mesh, uh, mesh for uh, right. the person of interest. Yes, exactly. So, but uh, so it doesn't work on, uh, on on a video or on any outdoor scene. So it, this is a quite uh, uh, focused. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, we show outdoor results. I mean the. What the method is, it's person specific, right? So, so it's person specific. So, yeah, indeed, yeah. It, but it doesn't work in a context of a self driving car where you don't know the. I mean, if you want to get all this 3D information of uh, any person in the street, this is not possible, right? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it cannot. I mean, I will show you later some results on that. So to some extent, it can generalize to different people, but uh, I mean, it's made to be person specific by design. So for your setup, you support with respect to an application. If I want to use this at home, I need mm -hmm. to go somewhere and collect my own template mesh. Right. Yes. But okay. I mean, regarding then once the I have it, yes. Sorry. So then once uh, I have it, then uh, indeed I can actually play with it. So I can actually uh, move around and you will always be able to um, match the template to what I'm doing. Yes, exactly. So I mean, this template, getting the template is a one like a single time you have to do it. And afterwards you can do, uh, use or this person can do in the wild capture, so to say. Awesome. And the, the cost of getting the template, I mean, uh, I mean, you need a very expensive setup. Uh, no, I, I mean, we have, <laughs> we have a very expensive setup, uh, which is a, a scanner, which has multiple cameras. Um, but we also had projects like my previous projects, we reconstructed templates just from persons standing in a static T pose and you just walk around with a DSLR and you take a few shots from different angles and you put it into a commercial software. So that's also possible. Okay. I think getting the template by itself is not, uh, it doesn't require expensive setup. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a quick fol follow up on, the, on this question. So also the template is also like uh, linked to the cloud that you have, right? Yes, so yeah, the template contains basically the clothing as well as the body parts. So it's uh, like one single template that is, that has everything in it, so to say, yeah. Okay. It's not a multi-layered version where you have clothing and body parts separated. Mm -hmm. So if you change like the clothes, then you will assume they still have the same ones, basically in the, in the mesh. In yeah, the, yeah, in yeah. Prediction. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, so coming back to this. So, okay, we said direct supervision is difficult in the this, in this, in this setting. So instead, what we aimed for was a weekly supervised setup. And for that, we have the two networks get as supervision signals 2D joint detections from multiple views. And we also can get the foreground masks for, from multiple views. Um, so, and I go into detail how we obtain this in a second. Um, but what is important here is that if you want to evaluate these losses, you have to have differentiable 3D to 2D modules in some way. Um, yeah, so how do we get the training data and how do we get the annotations? So here you can see one example recording we did. Um, so we have a calib calibrated multi-view images here and we use OpenPost to get the 2D joint detections in all the views and we use a color keying to get the foreground mask. Um, so and this is automatic, uh, like can be automated and it's pretty easy to obtain. Okay, so once having the data ready, um, we can actually start with the network and how it's trained. Um, so what we have is as input, we take a single segmented input image that is randomly sampled from our multi-view capture. And what the, what the postnet is doing, it's uh, regressing the post in form of root rotation and the joint angles. Okay, and then we add a simple prior on these uh, joint angles to be within reasonable limits so that you do not exceed the anatomical limits of a human. Um, right. And then what follows is a kinematics layer, so a forward kinematics layer, um, which takes this skeletal pose and it computes the, for each landmark, the 3D position, but in camera and root relative space. So this is important and I come to a second, uh, I come to the point uh, why it is actually not trivial to evaluate the losses directly. Um, so as I said, it's in, uh, in camera and root relative space, but to evaluate these losses, you have to bring these markers into global space. So not in the camera space, right? And also not root relative anymore. Um, for that, what you have to apply is a rigid transform that brings these, uh, mar each marker into global space. And while the rotation component of this rigid transform can be or is simply the inverse extrinsic rotation of the input camera, the translation is a bit more tricky to compute. Um, and 
Therefore, I would like to spend a bit more time on explaining how we do it. And this is basically done in our global alignment layer. Um, right. So if we look at the problem setting here, it's what we are given is the 2D joint detection, 2D joint detections in all the views. And we also have the camera and root relative 3D landmark positions, right? And what we also have is the camera calibration. Um, so the goal here in this uh, in this step is to find the optimal translation, global translation of the root, such that the 3D landmarks project onto the 2D predictions. And this should be done for all views and landmarks. Okay, um, so let me illustrate this in 3D. So here for illustration purposes, I only used uh, two camera views and let's only consider the elbow, the right elbow as a joint. Um, and what you can see, what we have is the 2D prediction, which is marked in the, as a red circle in the different views. And now as we have the camera calibration given, you can also draw a 3D line through the origin of the camera and the 2D prediction. So which looks like this. And now what should ideally happen is that the skeleton uh, the 3D uh, joint of the skeleton, the elbow joint, should be close to these lines in 3D. Um, and all I want to say here is actually that, so, and then basically if you get the translation, it should be closer to the lines, right? And all I want to say here is that um, this problem that we have can be phrased as a multiple points to multiple lines fitting, um, which is, I think, a known problem, right? So it's, yeah, you can reduce it to this uh, kind of setting. And if you look at the uh, line fitting energy, it looks like this. Um, so what you have here is the line origin and the direction for each camera and for each marker. Then we have the camera and root relative 3D landmark positions, which we then say we use the in inverse camera rotation of the input camera. And this is the global translation we want to solve for. Uh, and what you can see is that this is basically the, the estimated global position, so this whole chunk. And you compare it to, uh, you co compute the distance, which is this minus and the cross product, to the line that is defined by the origin and the direction. And as I said, we do this for all cameras. So that's why we sum up over all cameras and all markers. And it's weighted by the uh, 2D joint detection confidence that is also provided by open post per marker and camera view. Um, so the nice thing about this energy is actually that it has a closed form solution for T by just rearranging the terms. And um, this closed form solution is also back probable with, or you can also differentiate through the root camera root relative 3D landmark positions which ultimately means that you can also backdrop into the post-net network, which is important if you want to train it, right? Um, okay, so that's how you obtain the global translation. So now we have the rotation translation and we can bring these markers into global space. And then we can evaluate the multi-view sparse key point loss. Um, and this is doing nothing else than projecting the 3D landmarks, the global ones, into all the views, and you compare the distance to the predicted joint to the joint position by open post. And this is how we train PostNet. Okay, so then we come to the second component, which is called DevNet, and this is regressing the embedded deformation. So we use the embedded deformation representation here. Um, and it's regressing the parameters for each of the nodes of the embedded graph in, as, the join, as the node rotation, as well as the translation. And uh, I want to note here again that this is in canonical pose. So that's why you always see the T pose here. Okay, so then first of all, we have a smoothness prior on this. Um, so here we use the as rigid as possible um, prior that was introduced by Sorkina and colleagues. Um, but yeah, and here the G in this equation is the node position. So the undeformed and unposed node position of the graph. But different from the original formulation, we use these rigidity weights per uh, node or per connection basically. And this helps us to model the different deformation behaviors of the surface. Because for example, uh, a, a node that is more attached to a skirt region should allow the surface much more to deform than if you have a node that is on skin. 
And to account for that, we have these different rigidity weights. So depending on where you are on the, or which node you look at, this is even is either higher or lower. Okay. So then if you have the rotation and translation from the def net as well as the post from the post net, you can combine it in our deformation layer, which is deforming and posing the uh, vertices and you get root relative vertices again, but it's also posing and deforming the landmarks. So also here, I would like to go in a little bit more detail. Um, so what we do is we first do the deformation in the canonical pose, and this is formulated as here. And what we have is the node position again in um, the, the undeformed node position. Then we have the template vertex, which is also undeformed. And then we have the estimate, the request node rotation. And this is an Euler angle, so that's why we have to convert it into a rotation matrix. And then what you are doing for each of the vertices, you rotate them locally around the node position, and you also translate it by the estimated node translation or by the request node translation. And this is uh, this WIK is uh, a, weight, a weighting term which weights for each vertex. It, it, each vertex is attached to different nodes in the graph, depending on how close they are to the vertex. And then you just sum over all of them. Okay, so this is about the deformation. And then if we apply the posing, the equation is quite similar. The only thing that changed here is that we now have a rotation that is parameterized over our estimated pose. So basically we are posing the graph and we take the rotation component of dual quaternion skin of the dual quaternion skinning, which is applied here. And then we also have the translational component of the dual quaternion skinning per node. And you again combine it by weighting the different nodes. Okay, so let me illustrate this. So what we have is this equation is basically doing the deformation in canonical pose, which you can see here in the green box. And if you do the posing on top, you get our final result. So this is the blue box here. Okay. So I was mentioning that again, we have root relative um, vertices and landmarks, and we again bring it to global space as discussed before. So we just use the same rotation translation request by our postnet, uh, in, which is computed in the postnet branch. Okay. Um, and then to supervise the DevNet, we have a sparse loss on the markers again, but this time the markers are, as I said, deformed and posed. So we look at the deformed markers and make sure that they still project onto the 2D, onto the 2D locations or 2D detections in the multi view. Um, so this is a rather sparse loss, but it helps that you still, that the surface is not drifting and that the pose is still maintained. And then we have a denser loss on the vertices directly um, by ensuring that our projected model matches the image silhouettes. And this we efficiently represent as a distance transform. So the silhouettes are efficiently represented as a distance transform. And how you can think of this is that each boundary vertex should lie at the zero contour line of this distance transform. And this is very efficient to compute. That's why we chose this representation. And since quite some people asked me how do you get the set of boundary vertices for all the views, um, I would like to refer to our CUDA-based rasterizer, which is also now available on GitHub. So you can also check that out. And what it is essentially doing to compute the, um, to compute the boundary vertices is we compute a depth map for all views. And then for each vertex, we just check if it projects onto the background in the sense that we have a, at the location of projection, we have a search window, it's three by three in our case, and you check if you hit a pixel that whose depth is infinity, so which is a background pixel. And if, if this is true, you say it's a boundary vertex and otherwise it's not. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's how we train DefNet. And now let me show you some qualitative results. Um, so in the top corner, you can see the segmented input image. And in the middle, you can see our uh, request pose as well as surface deformation. And you can see it's, I, I would say it's relatively stable in 3D and it also looks plausible in terms of deformation, having in mind that you only have a single input image here. 
Then we also have some possible applications we showcase here. So one is you can augment the video. Um, so here we show our reconstruction in different rendering modes so with wireframe and texture. Right. And here we use our application, uh, our approach to augment the video in the sense that we replace or we insert a texture on top. Um, so you can see I'm doing some motions, then we have our underlying model, and then we insert this Superman logo here on top of my shirt. And the nice thing about it is that it, since we track the model, also our texture is occlusion aware. So when I move my arm in front of it, it's also occluded. And this would not be possible with image-based solutions, or at least not easily possible. Um, another nice application, well, yeah, so result is uh, where we had a 3D moving camera. So I think this was yeah, recorded with a handheld camera. And you can see that our results still overlays quite nicely to the input. Okay, um, yeah, some qualitative comparisons uh, to previous work. Um, so here, oh, sorry. No, it's not doing. Let me again okay so here we comp compare to my previous work live cap um, which is a template based method um, and you can see that live cap usually gives you a pretty nice overlay in the input view so which is the top row but in the reference view it still suffers from the monocular setting and when you compare it to deep cap you can see from the multi-view su supervision the network learns to predict the correct pose also in 3d so the overlay looks good, but also in 3D, the pose is correct. And here we compare to implicit methods. Um, so in a 3D view, um, because you cannot uh, easily overlay them to reference views. Uh, and what you can see is that their approaches usually suffers from missing limbs when the pose is very articulated, uh, which is not the case for ours because we have an underlying articulated structure. So in that sense, it's always preserves or prevents this case, so to say. And on the other hand, also our approach gives you a consistent geometry, which for example, allows you this uh, texture augmentation that I was showing before. Um, uh, Mark, for these uh, two uh, compression, are they using the same uh, assumptions of uh, having a, a template mesh? Uh, no, uh, I come to that point. Um, so, I mean, I have to say, so in these comparisons, um, yeah, I wanted to point it out on the next slide. Um, so these are general methods, right? So they uh, can generalize across people, um, whereas we wanted to focus on capturing high details and, uh, you know, a consistent geometry over time. But I think still it's the most closely related work. And I think a comparison makes sense to see which kind of directions you can you can take, right? So one is, of course, generalization across people, and the other is going more in the direction of personalized capture, but at a higher quality. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point here, yes. But um, yeah, I think it's just, we are, we are or, yeah, I think there is the uh, problem space is like in these two directions, generalization and getting higher fidelity characters. Um, but still, I think it was the, most closely related work that that is out there at the moment, so to say. So maybe also related to this on all these previous videos where uh, you're showing these nice uh, uh, visualization. Mm -hmm. um, I'm supposing that basically the same person with the same clothes uh, was captured before in your uh, setup. And then you ask that person, to maybe continue to move around to, to make your videos, is it correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so each, uh, yeah, for each subject, we have a different uh, character, but also different network, yes. Uh, so, so even if it's a personalized version, it's actually a personalized um, things for the same clothes and same time. So it's not like, for instance, on a second day with different clothes, it will work as well. I mean, it will work on a second day, a second uh, on a separate day with the same clothing, right? So these captures were not co uh, recorded continuously. 
So you can even see it because my haircut changed in between. So before I had much shorter hair and in the in the wild captures, my hair was a bit longer in the end. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I mean, again, so it's person specific, but that's, uh, yeah, that's by design choice, so to say. Okay. Um, so then some quantitative measurements. Um, so what we evaluated here is the surface reconstruction accuracy um, by using the multi-U intersection over union metric. So which is a measure of how well your reconstruction overlays with the ground through foreground mask in different camera views. And um, again, also here uh, to mention HMR and HMMR, they are both works that capture the pose as well as the naked human body shape from the simple model. Um, so they are person unspecific, um, while life cap is person specific in the sense that it requires a template. And you can see that we outperform the uh, HMR and HMMR because they cannot really account for clothing. Um, and we also outperform life cap because as I already showed, it suffers from the 3D setting. So, Usually the overlay is good, but in 3D the pose can can be off due to the monocular, uh, to the due to the monocular ambiguities. Um, right. So then I would like to also show some ablation on one of the components, which is the the, the deafness, so the deformation, uh, to get an impression of how much it does. So in terms of or compared to if you only skin the model, so if you only drive it by the pose. And you can see that if you use the DevNet on top, it can capture these uh, deformations of the surface, like the moving of the skirt here, but it can also correct skinning artifacts. So you can see if I raise my arm, you get these candy wrappers under, yeah, under my arm, and they are fixed by the, by the DevNet in the end. Okay, so now coming to the limitations. I mean, you, also, you already pointed it out. Um, so I think the biggest limitation at the moment is that we are person specific. Um, and for that, we, we also tested it uh, in the sense that we tried a different person than the training subject, but in the same clothing. Uh, and you can see that the results, I mean, they are not as good as the ones you have seen before, but still it gives you a reasonable result, I would say. Um, and this gives hope that you can maybe also train a model or make the model generalizable across people so that you don't have to do it in a person specific way. Um, but obviously this also has challenges in terms of collection of data and all these things. And another limitation that you can see here is that if you have a pose that is outside the distribution of poses that was seen during training, like which is happening here, so handstand was not in the training set, uh, it can fail um, just because it has never seen something like this before. Um, but on the other hand, you can also see that it, it recovers immediately after you come back to a post that is more close to the distribution of poses that you have seen during training. Um, right. So with that, I would like to thank you um, for your time. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, maybe let's wait for the waiting. <laughs> and uh, do you have questions? Thank you. We definitely enjoyed it. It was a very interesting presentation. Yes, let's open up to, to questions, I would say. I already asked one, so I'll ask. I let someone else do it first. 